right on the set. Feely Rose Amador, and this is Native Voice TV. Well, you know the election's coming up, and we'll have a new president pretty soon, and I hope everyone out there is registered to vote. Well, I was wandering around the West Valley powwow just recently, and I ran into my good friend, Leon Chifelk. Hi, Leon. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. And you were sitting out there with a, t standing out there with a table, and you were registering people, and you had these little Obama signs, and you have an Obama t-shirt on, and you're here to tell me why I should vote for Obama, and Native people should. Well, I guess it, it's, it's not as simple, I guess, as what, what I'm doing. Um, everybody knows the policies and, uh, of a candidate so far, but I want to tell you a story of a man named Eagle Robe. And Eagle Robe was my great-grandfather. I was born and raised in North Central Montana on the Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. And um, he raised my aunt, my Aunt Brownell woman. Uh, Eagle Robe was born in the, probably the mid-1800s. And he survived the Indian Wars and survived the transition to reservations. Uh, he, was a, he was a medicine man. Uh, he was very, he was a very, you know, intellectual man. He could speak fluently three languages of the, of the tribes in the area, you know, the, the Assiniboine and, and the Blackfeet, and um, I think it was the Crow that he could, he could speak, and he knew sign language, so basically that was a fourth language mm -hmm. to communicate with other tribes. And as an Indian tradition, the grandparents will always raise the oldest child, and that was my aunt, so they raised her. And he, he prided himself in being independent, and to trade with, on off the reservation with the local white community, he taught himself how to, how to speak English. And obviously it was probably broken English and he taught himself how to count so he could keep the merchants um, um, honest. Mm -hmm. Well, and at the time my aunt was going to mission school so she could speak English, but he asked her to come along with him, you know, just to be there, you know, to kind of make sure that uh, they were being honest with him. And she said that she remembers the way they talked to him and when he turned around they had a certain tone and inflection of their voice where they and she said she didn't quite understand it but she knew it hurt mm -hmm. and it wasn't words it was the way they were talking about him like he was less than intelligent you know he you know there was something wrong with him and here there was this absolutely brilliant man and they and they were talking about him in that manner and it really hurt her and she mm -hmm. said she went home and cried and she never understood why and this was like you know, back, in, and my aunt right now is in, in her mid-80s. Well, last spring, fast forward 60, 70 years, the primary was going on. Mm -hmm. And the kids had the TV on, and she could hear Hillary Clinton talking about Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And she spoke in such a way that my aunt said she wasn't listening to what she was saying. She was listening to it how she was saying it. And it was that same inflection, the same mm -hmm. tone. She wasn't directly tearing him down, but she was speaking to him such a tone that he was less than human. So it was the she, way they talked right. to you. Yeah, you know, she, did, she couldn't even give him the respect. You know, maybe the subconscious, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So obviously Brock won, you know, and, and we moved on with that. And now we're, you know, in, in you know, a month away from the um, elections. Um, and of course, you know, McCain and Palin, the way they, you know, they talk about him that again, and she said, it, it's, it's just more obvious the way they talk about him. And here he is this really intelligent man, you know, finished, you know, in the top of his class in Harvard Law School, 
you know, it would come from a broken family and he did all these, you know, made all these achievements in life. And McCain was last in his class at the Naval Academy. And he was probably allowed to get in there because his dad was an admiral and then he got into flight school, what was reserved for the cream of the crop, probably because his dad was an admiral and Palin, you know, how many colleges she went to. So Barack has to be twice as good right. to be considered less than they are. And it's just their tone. And it is so disrespectful that a lot of these, my aunt has um, rallied a lot of the senior groups in Montana. Oh, really? Uh, there's an older Indian lady who's 92 years old. She's never voted, and she is angry she's voting. Wow. Um, so a lot of the elders back there, and of course, coming from a matriarchal tribe, all she has to do is snap her fingers, so she gave all of us marching orders to to do what we can do. Oh. You know, if we could give a little money, um, give a little time. So everybody that's in my family is voting and, and all within these groups, so... Um, he has inspired a lot of people to, to, you know, to vote for their first time in their life. Hmm. He gives us hope, naturally. Wow. Okay, you convinced me. No, I was supporting him anyhow. <laughs> Not initially, you know that, but um, that's the only hope we have right now. So, right. you know, I, I do hope he makes it because uh, we have to get people energized to get out there and vote. I guess, is it too late to register now or couldn't you still register? Uh, you can still register. I think it's too late to register for absentee. Okay. Yeah. So you can uh, still register to go and vote. Right. And since I've been involved, I also found out that if you're an ex-con, you can vote. For years, I thought, you know, somebody That's what I thought, too. ex-con couldn't vote. You just can't be in prison or on parole. But other than that, um, you could register. You could register and vote. Well, I hope everybody registers and I hope Everybody votes because we can't sit back silent and let someone else make that decision for us. Oh, yeah, I agree totally. So thanks for your work out there, and you got my vote. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. And we have to remember that, you know, this show is sponsored by ARP, and ARP is the dividedwefail.org, you know, because um, we will fail as a people if we don't stick together and get out there and make our voice. We want to remember AARP, dividedwefail.org. And you know, it's, ARP, ARP is not just coming out during election time. They're around year round, looking out for the interest of all the people. So again, thanks, Leon. And now I'd like to welcome Al Cross. Welcome, you. Al. You've been on before and we've talked about relocation. And we've been waiting for you to come back and give us part two and part three. Yeah, yes, it has well. been. We're in a new studio now. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, we got a really nice spot. It's very convenient for me because it's about just five minutes from where I live. So. Oh, good. Well, then we can have you back more yeah. often then, right? <laughs> Keep the series going. So when we left off, I think we were talking about um, the older generations and mm -hmm. you were going to bring it more current. Mm -hmm. and Well, my idea is, and, and it was a kind of a combined idea. I'm, I was talking with Marty Wakazu up in uh, Oakland and we were talking about trying to get the group of Indians that first came out on relocation out here and have a reunion. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea I'm still pursuing is trying to get that idea going. And I've got to get some money together. But what I'd like to do, my idea is we have a lot of Indians here that came on relocation starting in the late, latter part of the 1950s. So they're just about 50 years now mm -hmm. in the cities from that initial group. Mm -hmm. And like the World War II veterans, they're starting to leave. So many are going home, some are passing on. So mm -hmm. it's important to get them and to capture some of their stories. So eventually I'll start with hopefully have a reunion because we have now, and then there's second generation, there's already third generation families from that particular initial, mm -hmm. initial, uh, re initial relocation. I came on relocation in 1960 to San Jose. So I've been here since Where 1960. Where did you come from? I came, well, I came via Albuquerque. <laughs> I'd been in Kansas and then I was you know, out on the road and mm -hmm. finished the Indian school in Kansas and then came through, I was working in Albuquerque and I came from Albuquerque to San Jose. Never had an idea what San Jose was or doesn't, but I, I picked it up. Um, 
So I've been in a city now almost two-thirds, well, a good two-thirds of my life, you know, and, and in San Jose particularly. I've got here. Initially, I did not like San Jose, and it took about two years, three years, to then I began to like it. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very well situated in San Jose now, and I probably will finish my life here. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important because if you look back in Indian history, Indians have been moved around. And the first big movement of Indians was back in 1830 when they had the Indian Removal Act, historically, and that moved Indians, all the Indians that were east of the Mississippi moved them west. Mm -hmm. This was government policy. Then the second big movement of Indians was during World War II. We had a lot of Indian men, Indian men and women that went out to serve in the armed forces and in the war industries. So there was another big, big movement of Indians, this time out into the outer world. It was the first kind of time the Indians start mingling outside the reservations. And did a lot stay where they were stationed? Um, we had some of that, not to a large degree, but that was sort of the seed for the relocation yeah. program. In the 1950s, again, this was the third, third time that they moved Indians, the 50s was kind of a, 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 an interesting era. It was, it was a very kind of a... a very conservative thing. A lot of bad things came out, particularly for Indians in that period. You know, amongst them was the relocation program. We had the termination program, and we had Public Law 280, which took away a lot of legal and civil rights of, of Indians on reservations. But the relocation program was on the end of that, on the end of those three, those three policies. Um, so what it did was it brought Indians from rural or reservation settings and brought them to the cities. The idea was to incorporate them into the economic settings in the cities, industrial economic settings. Um, they started, I think, the first program started with groups in, in Los Angeles. That was the first kind of, they started with the Navajo and they tried some initial programs. They were sort of the test, test group. And eventually it worked out to they had met, opened it to all the Indians in the United States. What it did was it allowed you some travel funds to the city of your choice, and then it gave you some initial help once you got there to kind of get situated. And then once you got a job, you were cut. That was, mm -hmm. you know, that was termed the, the successful. Well, it didn't exactly work that way, of course, but uh, that was the process. Mm -hmm. um, I was young. I was, you know, just married and down in Albuquerque. And so for me, it, it, I had no children. So for me, it was quite an adventure mm -hmm. rather than any kind of turmoil. I had gone to an Indian school, so I'd, I'd developed, I had a trade, I'd learned the trade at the Indian school, I was a bricklayer. So I came out in here with hopes of getting into, into the bricklaying business. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of stories, and, and, and we had in San Jose, we had a relocation office in San Jose, one in San Francisco and Oakland. So we had this, the Bay Area was the focal point of that, mm -hmm. as well as Los Angeles. They picked the larger cities, of course, industrial cities at that time that were still operating to try to get the Indians to, to relocate to. And they had the job training. <coughs> that was not instituted until later. later. Yeah, that, that came on later. After the criticism of the program, well, mm. then, of course, they instituted some job training ah, programs okay. and trying to help the Indians integrate or you know, assimilate into the cities. Um, so it was the beginning of a lot of, of, of our Indian populations now that are in cities and across the United mm -hmm. States. If you look at Los Angeles, Denver, Dallas, Tex Dallas uh, Texas, if you look at Chicago, mm -hmm. and of course right here in the Bay Area, another big, big population of Indians that came out of that program. So we still have some of the original relocatees, the people that are like myself who mm -hmm. were the original relocatees. And I want to capture some of the stories that they have in that process. Because it was, I, I term it as an inward migration. Because, you know, it was people just like, you know, when people came from across the, across the waters, these people came, but it was an inward migration. Mm -hmm. They moved to the cities and reestablished themselves. And there's a lot of wonderful stories in that, a lot of wonderful stories. And if we don't get them now, That's true. they're gone. And we have, like I say, we have the second and we have third generation now families from those particular people that came. And of course, they, as they grew up in the cities, they, they changed the idea of what an Indian is because they were situated and their environment was very different. 
So it's interesting to see now how they interact as an Indian, as an urban Indian, the term they use, they call them uh, urban Indians, mm -hmm. and how that impacts themselves in terms of their identity. So how so, are you looking mm -hmm. at recording them? In um, writing or? Well, an, I'd like video. to do I'd like to do with with camera. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the most available and probably the easiest mm -hmm. one. And we've got people now that are, that can do it within the Indian community. There's two mm -hmm. or three people that are into that, into film film. So somehow we can that. But the big kicker, of course, right here is finding some Fine. money, finding the money. But I initially start with a, I'll initially start with a relocation dinner. Mm -hmm and then try to talk to some people that could get them interested and I'd like to head towards maybe a PBS or something in that line. Because it's, it's as important in, yeah. in, in history. And our kids need to know that. Our, our children need to know that because it's part of their history. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll identify for them what, you know, what they are here and how they came here, what they came to be. So it's, it's a very important part of thing to do, I think. And if, you know, God willing, I have the strength and have the health, I can do it. You know, get this last to be one of my last projects. That would I be hope. a great documentary, yeah, huh? Yeah, so looking forward to that. But um, it, it's, uh, you know, there's just some wonderful stories and people that come. And you would come on a bus, they would put them on a bus or put them on a train, <laughs> and they'd end up in San Jose, California, or they'd end up in, in San Francisco, Oakland, or they'd end up in Los Angeles. And people that had, some of them had never been off the reservation before. So it was quite a traumatic change in, in, in their lives as they made at that time. How, was, how were people received? Was, was there a lot of uh, discrimination at that time? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think there was a lot of discrimination. They were just, you know, they were bewildered. They mm -hmm. come to, you know, a large city after living on a reservation. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, there was some, you know, some very humorous stories in how they adapted to that particular situation. Uh, Right downtown here in San Jose on, on Santa Clara Street, mm -hmm. West Santa Clara mm -hmm. Street, there was an old hotel called El Cortez. <laughs> there was a bar in the bottom and they had rooms on top. And this is where the Bureau was putting people you know, to stay in there, you know. So there was, that was one of the stories. But there's a lot of stories about people coming here. And you mentioned earlier in, uh, on that second movement during World War II, there were a small group of Indians that saw the city mm -hmm. and they liked it. And they stayed, and that's where the BIA got the idea. They seen uh -huh. those some of these Indians in these, in Oakland or some of the Indians in Los Angeles. They were working here in, in the West Coast on the on the war industries, mm -hmm. and um, so they got the idea, of course. And then, and the migration was just like any other group. Once you know a family came, then you had family members that came that joined, you know, that came on its own. Right. So it just increased the population. So we have a large population here in the Bay Area. Sometimes, I think the last census said 35,000 in the Bay Area connected. <coughs> but there's a good story. What percentage of uh, people go back to the reservation, say? Initially, you never could get a straight story on that. Initially, probably, I would say 60% went home. 60% went home. You know, and, and the Bureau, of course, wanting to show good, a good program, you know, they wouldn't disclose that. There's a, there was the way I look at seeing with this, there was about three groups that came to came to the city. I, I always look at them in that sense. There's one group that came of, of Indians that came. They saw it, they liked it, and they went ahead and, and they assimilated or they integrated. And there was another group that came. They came here and they were here from two weeks, maybe to two months, two years. They didn't like it. They went back, and then there was a middle bunch. <laughs> that didn't quite know whether they wanted to stay here or not. They would go back and they would come kind back. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. they would go back a while and they'd come back. So they were the ones that you know, had, had the more difficulty in adjusting and integrating into the city. But the initial group that came and they went ahead and they made their idea, they, they made a commitment, they went good. And then there was a group that decided nothing doing, they went home, you know. So there was a lot of interesting things that happened during that period. And of course, it became what had happened in that process in the Indian world changed completely because now we have Indians all over the over the country in different cities and they of course then impacted the reservations back home. That was a big impact. And I have a I have a brother in law in up in uh, Browning, Montana, he's Blackfeet. And he was telling me how much he said he thinks you know what it did was it solidified the Indians idea of themselves. Once they got to the city they they realized 
that they had an identity and they took that back. So it changed a lot of things. Earlier, Leon was talking about uh, his, his auntie and how she was listening to these people talk to them. Well, I grew up in that period. I grew up back in the 40s. And I can well, well identify with that, how that interchange took place between the, at that time, the, you know, the Bureau of people who were all non-Indian and the Indians. So it, it, it has made, we've made big changes in our lives. But the impact of the urban Indians on reservations, it also has had a big change, and, and somehow that has got to be brought out. But there's a lot of wonderful, as I said, many, many wonderful stories of people coming and transitioning and, and making this their lifetime, their life. I did a, a short documentary here some years ago, probably about 20 years ago. I think Leon remembers that one. Um, it was called uh, A View of Changing Lives. And I took 10 elders and I interviewed them and I talked to them about how, where they grew up and how now that they're living in a city, what that, how that perspective was changed in that. And I'd like to get that back together if I can ever find how to do it, but I'll try to get that back together. But we've got young kids now who um, are third generation and maybe even pushing fourth generation here in the city. Um, and the idea I have with them is to try to find out how they identify as Indian, mm -hmm. their identification as an Indian. Um, because obviously it's going to be very, very different from myself or from someone that grew up on, in a reservation. So they have a whole different way of identifying that. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So hopefully that's my plan is to try to move towards it. I'm, I'm, I got started and then I got, it ran into some stuff. I got stopped and now <laughs> getting started again. Back on track. Yeah. Now, do you teach? I, I taught. Yeah, college? I've taught. At, I taught at, um, at two or three colleges around okay. here, junior colleges, you uh -huh. know, the community colleges um, at West Valley. I was at West Valley for the longest period, yeah, and then at City College. I like City College and I like San Jose State because uh, the populations are the urban populations uh -huh. they have there. You know, they're they're a good mixed population there. I think the documentary you're looking at making would be. Uh, something that's really critical mm -hmm. for the native people but also educational oh, yeah, for yeah, everybody yeah, in yeah, general just yeah. to have in the schools i think there's not enough um educational materials on native people from native people it's always amazing you know um to when you talk to a group to know how much little they know about indians <laughs> and i mean it it, it it transcends all the levels, you know. I, you know, go to you can even go to you know to upper end of the thing, and you can talk to people, and, and they're well read, they're educated, and everything. But still, they know very little about Indians, you know. Um, so they need this is a story they need to know what happened, because policies by the government. I, my my position is that the Indian now is created by the government by the policies that had happened over these years, over these last many many years, and. Um, we're reservationized now, and we're finally breaking out of that mold now and becoming a lot different. Like we were talking, Leon, we're talking before that we said, you know, there's a lot of educated in this now back on reservations, on, uh, in the reservation system. So that's changing. So there's a big change, in, and um, we have this huge urban Indian population that is out there yet somewhere. So if I can get them together and do some kind of a decent thing and get in contact with somebody that's got some ideas of how to get, uh, you know, some promotion on it, I'll be doing that. I have to contact um, Marty again up in Oakland and see if, you know, he's still wanting to do that too. So eventually we'll have the Bay Area that we'll work with, you know. Well, definitely if there's any great funders out there <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that want to back this project, it's a, it's the uh, great project yeah, to back. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're looking forward to it. Anything we can do to help? Yeah, we'll, we'll do all. So all we it's, do. it's a lot of work, and, and mm -hmm. try to get started. But I'll start with the with the reunion dinner first, mm -hmm. and then from that go on. You know. And how are you going to track everyone down? Um, I'm just going to have to do it. You know, Spread get people to send in their names mm -hmm. and number, and, and give me some identification so I can kind of get an idea how many are there. I have no idea what what right. the population is right now. Well, of the original Rito Katie's. Mm -hmm. But that's getting smaller and smaller. I know that just from being around here, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good way to start, bring everyone together. And yeah. 
get it going. The main way is we do it the, uh, is we hand out leaflets at the powwows. You go to the powwows and <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> you get a stack of papers coming out of the powwows. So that'll be one way. But word of mouth mm -hmm. and do some little bit of um, you know television like here. Do mm -hmm. some of the papers um, and through the Indian Center through the newsletters. Right. But hopefully, you know, gather some idea of, get kind of a base idea of how many people are here. Great project. Quickly, tell me about the elder program, the luncheon. The oh. lunch you have. <laughs> yeah, we have a, what we call a third Saturday right. potluck. Every third Saturday of the month, we have a potluck. And we've just got new, um, a new location over on, the, on Centra Road. Right there. Oh, that's nice. Right there. Have you yeah. seen it? I haven't seen it yet, so I'm anxious to see I've seen the facility. I haven't yeah, seen the Yeah, inside. the facility. It's a big, um, big um, complex they built there, but we're supposed to have some nice space in there, hopefully. I don't know what it turns going to turn out to be, but uh, we'll be over there. We're going to have our potluck this month on the second weekend, not the third, because the third weekend they're having the uh, Heritage, Indian Heritage right. Day here. So we've kicked it up one, uh, one Saturday. So you're all, everybody's welcome. You don't have to be an elder. We, we uh, encourage people to come and eat with us. It's always a good potluck. Oh, it is. Um, and uh, it's on, if you go past Happy Hollow, you'll come to these kind of fancy colored buildings down there. That's that new complex right, that's there right. on Central Road. <coughs> but we have that every third Saturday of the month, um, with the exception of, um, I October. think, September, August or September, we, we take a break there. But okay. um, everybody's oh, welcome. That's a really nice event, and I have to go out there and... Yeah. And share some food out come there. Come out and eat so, with us. Yeah, come and eat with us. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for coming on the show again. And now that we know you're around the corner, we're just going to have to bring you over here a little bit more often and keep up with you and see what you're up to. Thank you for joining us at home. Don't forget to vote. Don't forget the Divided We Fail campaign. Don't forget to read El Observador, which is your bilingual weekly newspaper. They support Native Voice TV, too. And... We'll see you again next week, 6 o'clock, every Sunday at 6. Good evening. Thank you. Because we survive, indigenous ways, indigenous ways, are in the hearts of our children.